And so it seems at first as though astronomy cannot be the ground of any scientific conception of nature. But I think that there's a further reason why the Chinese had a fivefold numerology that's present in the Wuzi system of the five phases. And that is, I think that there's, there's not only a numerological, but also a geometrical reason uh, behind it all. And I think this is evidenced uh, not only in some of the excerpts that I've been sharing with you, but also in contemporary Taoist reflections upon what they call sacred geometry. And sacred geometry is a conception of geometry that's not simply a fiction of the human mind or a product of human thinking, but also in somebody conforms to the natural order of nature, so that there is correspondence or correlation between geometric ideas of the human mind and those of nature. The reason I shared with you the excerpt, the speculative cosmology of the Tao Te Ching, is because I think there's a way in which we can understand the numbers in the Tao Te Ching as producing the five-phase system. And I'm going to try to reconstruct that very briefly for you. Prior to all of the enumeration of the numbers, before the enumeration of the one, we have what they call the original silence. Uh, there was no number zero in Chinese. That was a product of Indian and Arabic numerals. The first number that they have, the number one, they identified as Yuan Jing Qi Xin, which they considered the fundamental tone of unity. And from the number one, they thought that it could be divided. Just like the cracks of the tortoiseshell has a separating of an original substance, whether it be in the stalk of a plant or in a tortoiseshell, Number two, once it has been fully divided, is identified just like yin and yang, with yang, the feminine principle, because it's open and it's receiving. Number two is thought to further divide into number three, uh, which they identify with the masculine principle, because it proceeds out of its, its equilibrium and its symmetry. This can be reconstructive uh, through geometry. Uh, we, if we start with a single circle with a point at the center, we can divide it into two circles, divided along the line, just as you would divide a single point into two points to make a single line. And this can be further identified with triangles that reach the intersections of the lines. And from this, we can create a pentagon. And from the pentagon, also a pentagram, which is suggestive of the Wu Xing theory of the five phases of nature. From the dual opposition to the pentagram, and then to the pentagram that's contained within the dual opposition. Now notice that the pentagram doesn't exceed it. It's not something that's separated from it, that's moving beyond it, but rather it's contained within it, as though it brings together the two points. There's something very curious about the pentagram that I think the Chinese would have been familiar with, and that is that there's an irrational number that's created by the relation between different line segments. And this irrational number is, in contemporary mathematics, is called phi. And one of the curiosities is when it's repeated successively, it creates successively smaller, but also proportionate line segments. This allows for the possibility of creating pentagrams within pentagrams that cycle within one another infinitely and without end. And the reason they're without end is because an irrational number doesn't have a concluding number. Mark Livio in The Golden Ratio summarizes that the pentagram is also closely related with the regular pentagon. If you connect all the vertices of the pentagon by diagonals, you obtain a pentagram. The diagonals also form smaller pentagon at the center, and the diagonals of this pentagon form a pentagram and yet a smaller pentagon. This progression can be continued ad infinitum, creating smaller and smaller pentagons and pentagrams. The striking property of all of these figures is that if you look at the line segments in the order of decreasing lengths, you can easily prove using elementary geometry that every segment is smaller than its predecessor by a factor that is precisely equal to the golden ratio, or phi. Most important, you can also use the fact that the process of creating a series of nested pentagrams and pentagons can be continued indefinitely to smaller and smaller sizes that prove rigorously that the diagonal and the side of the pentagon are incommensurable. That is, that the ratio of their lengths, which is equal to phi, cannot be expressed as rational ratio of two whole numbers. Although this was first discovered by the Pythagorean, it seems plausible to suppose that Chinese geometers would have intuited something of the correspondence and correlation of the five-fold numerology with pentagon and pentagrams as a fitting image of the natural symmetry and infinite complexity of nature proceeding from the highest and infinitely extensive macrocosm to the lowest and infinitesimally intensive microcosm. Pi is the inverse in terms of the relations of the ratios of pi, and just as pi doesn't have a concluding number, neither does phi. However, as John S. Major describes in Heaven and Earth and Early Han Thought, the coming into being of the cosmos is wu wei or non-purposive, and xiram thus of itself, but it is also orderly, predictable, on the subject of what might be cautiously described as the natural law, even in the absence of a divine lawgiver. The principles that make the cosmos orderly and predictable are elaborated in the theories of categorical and correlative thinking and Ganyin resonance. Correlative thinking and Ganyin resonance operate in the cosmology of the Huananza and to organize the world in, into a highly regular and predictable system. In that system, change and transformation, evolution and decay are still organic. The world remains unitary in a fundamental sense that the Tao embraces and underlies all things and reduces distinctions among them to epiphenomena. phenomena. Through the Tao, everything in the cosmos can affect everything else. A disturbance in one part of the system reverberates throughout the whole. 
For early Chinese, of all schools of thought, there was no necessary cleavage between the world of man and the world of nature, between organic and inorganic, between ethics and instinct. Nor was there any notion of a mechanistic universe, divine clockwork operating by mathematical laws that could be observed and formulated by people acting outside and apart from the machine. Han Chinese cosmology was enumerated and expressed in the Huan Nanzi. It was created by Liu An in the kingdom of Hunan in the early Han dynasty. He was patron of scholars and also a conspirer at the royal court. He was eventually executed because he was thought to have been conspiring to overthrow the king, which he probably was. Um, but he contributed this uh, work on cosmology. John S. Major in Heaven and Earth and Early Han Thought summarizes that Huan Nanza chapters 1, 2, and 3 offer a conception of the cosmos of coming into being uh, that are supplemented by additional cosmogonic passages found in the chapters of the text. Together they paint a picture of the cosmos that begins in formlessness, chaos, and void, goes through a process of differentiation governed by principles inherent in the system itself without the activity of a demiurge or divine craftsman, finally producing the world as it appears. This over persists for an unspecified duration in the mythic state before entering the realm of time and history, the distinction between the Urzeit and the age of historical times is of fundamental importance. As Girardot has written, the mythical theme of creation and paradise lost literally reverberates throughout the whole of the Huananza and, of course, throughout later Chinese imperial intellectual history. Later on during the Han Dynasty, Confucianism would try to present its own normative theories of virtue, human nature, social conduct, and propriety in terms of the cosmological theories of the Huananza and Han cosmology. Dong Zhongzhu's thought integrated yin-yang cosmology into a Confucian ethical framework as he emphasized the importance of the spring and autumn annuals as the source of both political and metaphysical ideas. John S. Major in Heaven and Earth and Early Han Thought writes, One of the achievements of Dong Zhongshu in forging around 105 BC the grand synthesis that laid the foundations of imperial Confucian ideology had been to incorporate the trigrams and hexagrams into the categorical thinking of Zhuo Yan and its Huang Lao heirs. This provided a vehicle for the introduction into natural philosophy of a whole range of Confucian ethical philosophy which had developed its own correlative categories, not only trigrams and hexagrams, but also, for example, the five virtues, which fit easily into the five-phase reasoning. Huan Nanza follows in Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu, and it presents a cosmogonical th sequence, or a, se a narrative of the origin of the universe, in which at the beginning there was a time before time, John S. Major in Heaven and Earth and Early summarized it as follows. He says that heaven and earth were inchoate in the unformed great cream void, and the nebulous void produced space-time, and space-time produced the primordial chi, so that the chi is the subtle medium that results from the geometric order of space-time. suggests that there's a logical priority of sacred geometry correlated with the natural cosmos that is the prior condition for the material medium of chi. A similar relational conception of space-time was present in Leibniz in early modern philosophy, who conceived of space as merely the relational and geometric order between the monadic points of all physical substances. Furthermore, he describes how she divides the light of pure forms of heaven from the heavy turbid forms of earth, and heaven and earth produce yin and yang. Yin and yang produce the four seasons, so that the phases of the seasons are a result of the prior logical opposition of yin and yang, which are already present in the original logic and geometry of the cosmos. John S. Major in Heaven and Earth and Early Han Thought summarizes the fall of the Tao into cosmic disequilibrium. The event of the famous battle between Gong Gong and Zhuan Zhu that causes the northwestern pillar of heaven to be knocked aslant is a mythic explanation of the non-coincidence of the elliptic, the apparent path of the sun and approximately the moon and the planets around the earth, and the celestial equator, the projection into space of the plane of the earth's rotation. Huananza tells how the goddess Nu Gua repaired the damage wrought by Guang Gong and Zhuan Zhu by patching the sky with five colored gemstones and using the legs of the giant turtle to replace the damaged pillars. That event marks the true beginning of time as it is calculated in human terms. The Urzite of cosmology comes to an end. Henceforth, the ruler must search for ways through calendrical and portent astronomy, the calculation of solar and Jovian years, and all of the other astrological methods described in Huananza 3 to avert celestial harm and recover a state of oneness with the universal process of cosmic order. History thus begins with man's attempt, through you the great's engineering works alluded to in Huananza 4.3, to recreate the cosmos after the universal deluge that was the consequence of the tilting of heaven and earth. As in the Christian West, the teleological end of Chinese ethics and statecraft was meant to restore the original unity that had existed before the fall into disequilibrium of the cosmos before the great battle between Gong Gong and Zhuang Yu, and the necessity of irrigation and government.
John P. Henderson in The Development and Decline of Chinese Cosmology summarizes that inasmuch as the sages first patterned the chief institutions of human culture on models taken ultimately from the natural world, the correspondences that could be established between the two realms were truly natural. By discovering such correlations, one, in a sense, recapitulated the creative process by which the sages brought civilization into being. Thus, correlative thought was seen as a logic that was ultimately directed towards re-establishing the complementarity and harmony between man and nature, nature and society, heaven and earth and ultimately directed towards restoring the Tao on an individual and collective scale. All of this, I think, is informative of the cosmological conceptions or the conception of nature in the early Han Dynasty that conditioned how Chinese physicians and the compilers of traditional Chinese medicine understood Chinese medicine, especially as it's represented in the classics of Chinese medicine, <laughs> such as the Yellow Emperor's Canon. The Yellow Emperor's Inner Classic, or the Huang Di Nei Jing, was thought to have been formulated during the late Han Dynasty. Qi, Yin Yang Theory, and Wu Xing Theory are altogether naturalized in a comprehensive scheme of human health which can be diagnosed through purely rational means, and thereby the treatment of medicine prescribed. The chief basis for good health and also for ill health was the maintenance of harmony between the meridians and qi of the body and those of the cosmos as a whole, so that Chinese natural cosmology totally informs and directs the diagnoses and prescriptions of traditional Chinese medicine. John P. Henderson, in The Development and Decline of Chinese Cosmology, summarizes that, Thus, the proper classification of medicines into a certain number of basic cosmological categories, such as yin, yang, and five phases, and five flavors, was theoretically a necessary preliminary to the cure of any disease. Here again, the proper construction of systems of correspondence was an urgent task. In this lecture, I have summarized how the classical conceptions of traditional Chinese medicine contained in yin-yang theory, Wuzing five phases theory, the correlationist logic of the I Ching and the Ganyin resonance, all had their roots in ancient Chinese Taoism, in the Huang Lao Taoism, in ancient divining of the Sheng court, and before that in prehistoric Paleolithic shamanism. The religious conception of the Tao informs, conditions, and directs Chinese medicine so that Chinese medicine, diagnosis, and prescription can only be understood through a prior understanding of the idea of the Tao.